Grand Knight, the Worthy Deputy Grand Knight. I think uh, I got really into this topic and ended up with a lot more material. I had to kind of break it into. I think I'm going to make this a two-parter. So uh, this is part one. I, uh, I actually want to begin this evening with a question. What was Pontius Pilate's name? That sounds like a trick question, right? Like who's buried in Grant's tomb? But in fact, it's not. It's a, a quite serious question. The Romans were one of several groups that occupied the Italian peninsula in antiquity. It took them about 200 years to conquer Italy before they really began to expand their empire beyond Italy. The Samnites were one of the last Italian groups to fall to the Romans. The Samnites occupied a, a territory that is mostly what we would know as uh, Abruzzo, maybe a little bit um, in the southwest Molise and northwest Campania. So kind of south central Italy, the hill country. Um, the Roman military was really built around its uh, heavy infantry, its legionnaires. They were organized into groups of 80 to 100 men called a century. The, Commander in charge of a century was, of course, a centurion. Uh, and they were built for, for, for close-in combat. So uh, they were better trained. They had better equipment, better organized, more disciplined than most of the peoples that they um, uh, engaged with militarily. Their uh, opponents tended to, to counter their infantry strength with archers. So the archers didn't have to get close enough to engage with a Roman sword. They could hang back and, and fire a volley of arrows, and, and that was how they tried to, to, uh, to keep the Romans at bay. The Romans developed a defensive response to this called the tortua, a formation where they would, they would drop to their knees. The, the centurion would call out tortua when, when, uh, when the archers would, would raise their bows, and they would drop to, to one knee and they would raise their shields, and they would overlap their shields like the scales of a of a steak or a fish, and then all the arrows would just kind of plink off the top of the shields. They'd bounce back up and they'd march another 10 steps forward while the archers reloaded, and then the centurion would, would uh, call out Tortua again, and they would drop down into that formation. The Samnites were able to hold the Romans at bay uh, much longer than most of the other peoples because they approached this problem differently. They uh, uh, countered the Roman infantry with these, these long, flexible uh, spears that had these very heavy 18-inch bronze spear points on them. They could run up to within 20, 30 yards of, of the Roman lines, still be well out of reach of the sword, and they would lob these. The Romans would drop into the Tortua formation, but the spears were so heavy, and they were, would come down with such force that they would go right through the shields and kill the men underneath. Um, we know that kind of spear by its Greek name, the javelin, but the, the Romans called that kind of spear the pilatus. Uh, the, uh, when the Romans finally did conquer the Samnites, they, they, they regarded the Samnites as, as barbarians, um, but they had, had great respect for their fighting prowess. So when they did finally conquer the Samnites, they did an interesting thing. They, they took all of these men who had fought so bravely against them, and they brought them into the empire by giving them land and titles, by making their sons and grandsons eligible to participate in the Roman patronage system so they could find a sponsor who would pay for their education, uh, make introductions, teach them etiquette. But the quid pro quo was that their sons and grandsons would serve as officers in the Roman military. It's actually this, this creation of this uh, aristocratic class, this minor noble class, this, this military class within the, the, the Roman system is really the, the origin of the, the, what will become the Knights of the Middle Ages. Uh, the Pontii were a prominent Samnite family. When I say uh, family, I mean an extended kind of family, like, like an Irish clan. Uh, I think the Latin word is gens, G-E-N-S. Um, the Pontii are well known to us from history. Uh, many members of that, of that family um, 
uh, you know, went on to, to, to prominent military careers, governorships, that sort of thing. Pontius Pilate. Pontius tells us that he was a member of that Samnite family. Now, he was an educated man. He would have spoken Latin, but he wasn't Roman at all. Ethnically, he was Samnite. They had their own language. They had their own religion. Pilate tells us that he was descended from one of these uh, Samnite warriors who had distinguished himself in battle against the Romans through use of the Pilatus. Pontius Pilate is an example of a cognomen. Uh, we don't really have such a thing today. It's, it's a bit like, like a trade name uh, a, um, or a nickname, except that it was in the Roman world, it was legally interchangeable with a personal name. So he would have had a personal name, but that name would have been used primarily among family and friends. Publicly, he was known as Pontius Pilate. There was actually a, uh, a description found in uh, Caesarea um, in uh, 1964, the stone had been reused. It was found as, the, as, a, as an amphitheater was being excavated. But it was a, a dedicatory inscription. Uh, Pilate had um, uh, constructed a temple dedicated to the, the Roman emperor Trajan. And, uh, and the inscription, in the inscription stone, Pilate identifies himself as Pontius Pilate. So that's how he was known. And we have references to him from Josephus, uh, first century Jewish historian, Tacitus, the Roman historian in your contemporary. Um, so it, that, that was his public name, but not his personal name. So what was Pontius Pilate's name? We don't know, or at least we can't connect him. There, we know a lot of names of, uh, of military governors, military uh, officers, people who had distinguished military careers. We know the names of many people uh, who were members of the Pontii family. So we might, we might know who he was, but we can't connect the personal name to, to Pontius Pilate. We just don't have an answer to that. Um, uh, Pilate was recalled to Rome in 36 AD. He, he put down a, a, a demonstration in such a brutal fashion that, uh, that he actually offended Roman sensibilities. So it must have been bad. Uh, he's called back to Rome in 36. It takes about four months, took him about four months to travel from Judea to Rome. And, uh, and while he was making that journey, the Roman Emperor Trajan died. Um, he was succeeded by his nephew Caligula. We don't need to talk about Caligula, except to say he did appoint his horse to the Roman Senate, and as we uh, we come upon our elections and I watch political ads, I'm, I'm increasingly sympathetic to the idea of replacing our senators with horses. Uh, but uh, when he got to Rome, we had a, you know, there was a new, a new emperor in power, and uh, it doesn't appear that he ever faced a trial or an inquest. But what becomes of him, we don't know, but we have interesting hints in, in early, uh, early Christian writings, in the New Testament itself. He's really kind of the subject of a uh, of an enduring mystery, and that's where I want to pick up with part two. So, thank you. Always fascinating. Thank you.